And we are the Coalition, loud and proud, outrage porn free, civilly disobedient media broadcasting live on the Worldwide Coalition Network here at the Go Local Live Broadcast Center, deep in the heart of the city we love, Providence, Rhode Island, La Prave, the naked city, the renaissance city, the city of, well, 365,000 stories. We're going to tell a few tonight. Facebook.com slash The Coalition Radio on the Mighty Mighty Twitter at Coalition underscore radio and, of course, the mothership at CoalitionRadio.us. Folks, it's Pride Weekend. Well, it's Pride Month, but specifically in Providence, it's Pride Weekend. If you've never had an opportunity to catch the Pride Parade, which is traditionally held a Saturday night of Pride Weekend, immediately after sundown, you are missing something very special. The LGBTQIA community here in Rhode Island has given us so much culture, so much financial strength, so much sophistication, so much, they've input so much into the community that every year as, as a city, as a family, we get together and celebrate their heritage, their legacy, their history, and their contribution to the community. And we also have one hell of a party. So tomorrow night, if you have a few minutes, come downtown. It gets a little raucous, but it's love, it's friendship, it's family. Folks who might be considering themselves straight, folks who from the, like I said, the LGBTQIA community. All of Providence restaurants are open. It is a remarkable night to be in Providence, Rhode Island. It's quite frankly an accumulation of so much of what reasons why we live here. So please don't miss it. The parade will march right down the street in front of us. I almost wish we broadcast on Saturday night so we could be part of it. I'll be out there. My family and friends will be out there. My extended family and political family will be out there. I hope I see you and if you run into me, come up and say hi and let's chat and let's toast everything that is special in Rhode Island. Tonight we've got a very special lineup in addition to my guests sitting immediately to my left. In about an hour and a half or so, we're going to have John Sambato from Yacht Club Bottling. John, of course, is a longtime sponsor of this show. Last night I spent quality time up in the uh, Mordor slash Halitosis Hall fighting an annual attempt to resurrect a sugary sweet beverage tax. We're going to talk about that for a few minutes, but again, tonight's a night of celebration. We're going to toast in some new product offerings that he's got. We'll talk about the challenges and the rewards of being a Rhode Island business. And at the same time, maybe take a few gentle, loving shots at laws that would seek to weaponize our taxation system to go directly after, well, in his case, a 100-plus year family-owned business, taxpayer, contributor to the community. So we'll talk a little bit of that. And, of course, in the last hour, we'll have a couple of people calling in on the libertarian movement. One of the great things about having your own talk show is you get to meet and talk to all the people that, well, quite frankly, you've always really wanted to talk to. And tonight is, is an example of that. Sitting next to me is an individual who is a lifetime defined public service, literally born into it, but understanding both the responsibility of the mantle he has inherited. He has on his own been a mayor, a United States senator, a governor, an environmentalist, and would appear now a political philosopher. We'll talk more about that. But I first wanted to welcome Senator Lincoln Chaffee to the show. Thank you for joining me tonight. Good to be here, Pat. Thank you. I, I know you're in town, and you know much has been made, much has been spoken about about your family's move to Wyoming, um, as is some political conversations you're having with 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 a new a new group of people lately. And and again, remember, folks, the purpose of this show is, as we say, we're outrage point free. We celebrate not people's differences, but we look to where the spirit of cooperation. Honest, sometimes tough conversations can bring people together to work towards the common goals that we agree on. Clearly, Rhode Island and the country faces challenges that are <laughs> we have not seen really since, I believe, World War II and the beginning of the Cold War. Many of them are more cultural based as opposed to the wartime footing that we had to assume then. So the point of the show is not to insult or to hate or to diminish. The point of the show is to have open conversation about finding ways that we can agree on how we face the philosophical, cultural, economic challenges that this country faces right now. Uh, let's talk about just a, a little bit about being a Chafee and someone who is, who is very well educated, someone who had their own independent career. You decided on your own to enter public life. Well, one of the things I've never heard you really explain, what was your motivation for that? What, you know, how, how did that come to be? Well, I saw how much my uh, dad enjoyed it, and uh, that was 
the biggest motivator. If you can go to work every day and enjoy your work, uh, then that's a winning formula. And uh, he was the old Eisenhower, Rockefeller, Republican, right. fiscally conservative, socially liberal. Right. And we talked about you talked about gay uh, pride mm -hmm. week uh, weekend coming up. Um, very proud to have passed a gay marriage here in Rhode Island, despite right. the fighting of the uh, bishop, fought it tooth and nail, calling senators. And in the end, when the senators voted, it was 26 to 12. It was an overwhelming vote mm -hmm. in favor of uh, marriage equality. Right, and, and, and there are two folks that really can take the credit for that. Yourself, as far as coming from the other side of Madison, Senator at that time, Senator Dawson Hodson. So the two of you actually did a remarkable job in advancing that. But all the Republicans in the Senate, the right. few that there were, were there eight, but right. they all voted for marriage equality. Right, and then some of them had to be shepherded along in the process, and you know that's how the sausage is made. Well, that's the old style Republican, which uh, obviously is long gone. Yeah, and, and we want to talk about that today. But but there's more than that. There was there were families in in America that responded to the call, it's very often first generation, and then there were families in America that it was multi-generational. And you did not have to get involved in, in, in politics. You would have been very successful, quite frankly, on your own, you know, following your own path originally as a farrier, but again, an Ivy League education. Certainly, you could have occupied careers in banking or finance or virtually anything. What? And, and, and to your credit, you started out at the entry level, in a sense. You, you started out at, at the city and town level, uh, an education of which, and the absence of which, I think makes folks lesser public servants, because you've seen at the ground floor how government impacts individual families, people's lives. So you didn't have to do that. What, what was, again, what was the motivation? How did, what was, where, where was the fight? Where did that come from? The main thing, as I said, is uh, seeing how much my dad enjoyed it. And it's, it's not an easy job. <laughs> uh, and you take the slings and arrows, but um, he loved it. He loved his work and uh, making a difference in the community, whether it's as a governor, as a senator, or as mayor and councilman. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I ran, I started at the local level. My first office was as a, an obscure election that's held every 20 or 30 years to elect delegates to our constitutional convention right. off year. And I ran and won, so I became a delegate. And I did enjoy it, and then ran for a, against an incumbent as councilman, mm -hmm. enjoyed that, and then uh, ran as the first Republican for mayor uh, to win in 32 years. The first time I was not successful. Mm -hmm. Second time is a two-year term. Two years later, I came back and became the first Republican mayor in 32 years. Very, very democratic city. Right. The council was eight to one uh, Democrats. and. Uh, uh, I hired Democrats. I knew I had to uh, right. do a good job as mayor in order to be successful and get reelected in two years. And I was reelected uh, three times. The last time carrying every ward and every district, every, even the most democratic district in Warwick, I carried my, uh, in my fourth reelect. Right. And so I'm very proud of that. Right. And, and, and also, Pat, mm -hmm. you mentioned being a, a a mayor and knowing what it's like at the local level, that's really good experience. I've lived it. I know what it's like at the local level, dealing with the public safety and the police and fire, dealing with the school system, mm -hmm. dealing with public works, dealing with a sewer plant, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, as senator, uh, federal issues, and then as governor, state issues. I think there's only three or four Americans that have been a mayor, a senator, and a governor. I know Pete Wilson from California right. was mayor of San Diego, governor, and I can't think of any other so. So I'm guessing there's probably only three or four right. uh, that have served as a local level, mm -hmm. federal level, and state level. And, and, and what impact did that have on you actually, and if there's a theme in your political career, it is that you have followed your own muse, you've followed your own, you've always looked to your own conscience, if you will, to make decisions. How, how did that impact that? Well, my dad was a big influence on that. Uh, he lost an election by proposing an income tax, which Rhode Island needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, the candidate that beat him, the politician that beat him, of course, went immediately put in the income tax because right. Rhode Island needed it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's beneficial, to, just to be honest. And in my 30 years of public service, uh, uh, I've said what I believe in my heart and my conscience. And I lost my Senate race. Uh, because I stayed a Republican in order to deliver for Rhode Island because the Republicans had the power in the Senate House and the White House. Right. So I needed Rhode Island to prosper on the highway bill and the military bill. Uh, so I stayed a Republican, even though I knew it would cost me my reelect, most likely, which it did in 2006. 
Uh, so I'm proud to have uh, always just lived and voted my conscience. That's taken on a lot of different levels. And what's intriguing is if you're a student of politics, and when I mean being a student of politics, these days, following politics seems to have been reduced to, unfortunately, whatever the talking heads are screaming at each other. I always call it the ESPN of, of American, American government, where it's more important to get a sound bite and a gotcha moment on one of these screaming head shows as opposed to actually advancing a thought, an idea, and, and, and allowing it through no pride of ownership. And that's an important notion that we've lost in American government today. No pride of ownership. Allowing it to be advanced, perhaps changed, perhaps beaten up a little bit, sometimes cast aside completely. Without that being a negative influence, either A, on, your, on the immediate conversation at hand, or B, in the longer term on your career. There was a time in American government where folks coalesced. And the greater good was finding a solution to a problem as opposed to simply having a we showed them moment. And, and, and that's, uh, as an outsider, as someone who has not held political office at that level, that seems to be what, what, what's missing. What, what are your thoughts on that after all these years? Well, I'm proud that uh, someone who tracks these type of things uh, has rated my bipartisanship in the Senate as it's still the record. They rate it, give it a number, and right. I've got the highest on record. Uh, but now it's just so polarized. It seems to get worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the reasons I joined the Libertarian Party. It's, it's time for something different. Democrats and Republicans are in their trenches. Mm -hmm. They're blowing mustard gas and machine gun fire at each other, and it's just not changing. And right. and, we need something different. And, and as someone who's been successful at a very high level running in the, as a third-party candidate or as an independent candidate, I find that intriguing because we in the libertarian movement talk about the duopoly all the time and the duopoly's stranglehold, if you will, in American politics. It was with no small sense of irony today as we watch the press releases roll out about the 20 Democratic candidates who are going to be running and what seems to be a not-so-elegant rehash of the last time around when it was about 35 or 40 Republicans. We find great irony that when it comes to the presidential debates that we can only have two people on the stage because of order. Oops. Now, and, and so I want to. I, I want that's a, that's an avenue that we're definitely going to go down a little bit. But let's, let's talk about issues because issues have, have defined your political career. You have found yourself, for a variety of reasons, at different times at each stage in your career, literally in the headlights, in the crossfire, um, on, on on major contentious moments in American history, and you know some of them are important on a global level. Some of them are more of a regional issue, but I'm going to take one of the more obscure ones, which was transportation funding. And I say that's, it's almost unfair to cast that as obscure because that is one of the singular challenges that Rhode Island faces now. While you were governor, we're going to jump around in history a little bit here, but we're not going in any particular order. While you were governor, what did you propose, address, because you addressed the bridges, the roads, everything. What, what was your proposal as far as budgeting for that? Well, we have uh, four bridges, um, four main bridges going into Aquidneck Island and, and Connecticut Island, Jamestown, uh, the Mount Hope, the Jamestown, the Newport, and the Sakonet. Mm -hmm. And they're all under the Bridge and Turnpike Authority. Mm -hmm. And we just needed more revenue in, in order to maintain these bridges because mm -hmm. we had to replace the Sakonet Bridge mm -hmm. because there wasn't maintenance. And it's just insanity. Right. After way before its time should have been for its life. 40 right. years or whatever it was, uh, and we were placing it at 70 million, 80 million dollars, whatever it was. So I had to propose a user fee, which is a toll. Uh, and man, was that a was that uh, controversial? And we had a very low uh, toll fee, user fee for the Sakana Bridge, but man, did that get people angry. Right. And yet here we are, a dozen years or so later, we've now had to because of our failure to adequately address funding. And as a libertarian, I would say to you, well, let's, let's just turn it over to free market. But for, for purposes of today's conversation, rather than a, fulfill some type of vision then, we now find ourselves where instead of a handful of user fees, we've got tolling, expensive bonding. You wanted to really pay as you went, didn't you? That was, that was your philosophy. Yes, and I also uh, was able to cobble together enough money so that we were not having bond issues. Right. 
to pay for our 20% in order to get the 80% federal funding. The formula right. requires the state to pony up the 20%. Right. And every two years, we'd have a bond issue, right. which, of course, you have to pay interest on. And I got us off that for the first time. We cobbled together enough funding to pay for the 20% without mm -hmm. going to a bond issue. And then, therefore, obviously having to pay for the interest on that bond. Right. And now and So it's an overall savings. That's right. So someone who's a mayor, and this really speaks to the the efficiency should be looking for, you had to live the bonding nightmare. And, and in fact, some of the challenges... I don't like to borrow. I'm old-fashioned. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are a New England Yankee. You are a... <laughs> Pay for it. The living definition. So, it, it, again, and, and this is what's fascinating about the Lincoln Chafee story, because if we'd, instead of, and, and I was probably... I don't like to pay interest. I was it's probably... like your MasterCard. Right. I was ah. probably part of that rabble. You know, rather than address the issue... Instead, we just screamed at each other, and we ultimately did nothing. Well, the Sakata Bridge had to be replaced. Right. And if we didn't build a new one, mm -hmm. what, are you going to have a ferry? And then, like you said, the libertarian uh, the, uh, free enterprise right. have a ferry going back and forth? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Rowboat? Yeah, yeah. Do that. Yeah, okay. Now we have to build a new bridge. Now we yeah. have to pay for it. Huck Finn. Yeah. And, the best, and why not the people that use it? Right. And I think we were down to 50 cents a trip or something. It wasn't burdensome. How many times you throw 50 cents in the Starbucks Dunkin' Donuts tip can? Right. And now, of course, we're, we're generating millions of dollars in bond fees. And, and, and folks... Lawyers it, it, and, yeah. Lawyers, yeah. guns, and money. I mean, you know, if folks don't understand, because there's so little transparency on it, on the effective cost of government funding through the use of bonding, of any project whatsoever, it's it's just astonishing the type of money it blows up. And and again, this is this is why everybody I, takes their piece. Every, every everybody does. And, and so that's that's just really the tip of the iceberg too. Because I, let, let's let's go back to time. Let's let's talk about. You brought up some of the things that I took a lot of heat for the capital punishment case. I was actually that's on my list. The you were able to. That was another odd one. Well, the people went nuts. You, you, they did not want to subject this mm -hmm. murderer right. to the federal law, which would have been open to execution because Rhode Island does not have capital punishment. That's a libertarian viewpoint. Libertarians are against capital punishment. We are. And uh, could serve innocent them. people get murdered, as did happen in the 1850s in Rhode Island, and that's why we abolished it. Right. So what was the you, Hysteria you, grips in the, back in 1850. The mill owner was killed, and they grabbed some poor immigrant mm -hmm. and uh, hung him. And he was innocent. And so that does happen. And uh, Jason Plow, I think was his name, uh, mm -hmm. was the murderer. And he admitted to the murder. Uh, and he was going to serve life without parole. And uh, I would not allow the federal government to come in and take him and prosecute him on a federal crime, which would have subjected him to the death penalty. Man, did I take a beating on that, on talk radio. And, and yet. And it's a Rhode Island thing. We should be proud to be against capital punishment. Years later, as you look at things like the Innocent Project, and you look at you know the advent of DNA testing, which was really just at its inception at that point, we now understand, regardless of how you feel about the death penalty, regardless if you're one of these law and order types who's, who's just going to, and it's libertarians, we're not, and, we're not, and it, 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 you're, you understand the frailty of any justice program, justice system. You, yeah. just, you understand that it's fundamentally Mistakes do happen. run by humans who are, in fact, human. Yeah. And hysteria can come into play. Right. Quick, grab somebody, and, and string them up in front of a crowd. Right. And tragedy should never drive public policy. It, it, it just never should. So I look back at that, and I remember the, 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 the sort of, you, you had to go through a couple of, I'll say, hoops, if you will, to, to extend that precedent on to this one. But years later now, most states, most folks are coming to terms with the barbarity New Hampshire just eliminated it, overrode Governor Sununu's veto. Right. And live free or die state, a conservative state, uh, legislators had enough votes to override the governor's veto, to abolish capital punishment. Good libertarian policy. As is the gay rights. These are, these are good old-fashioned Republican, fiscally conservative, don't bond money, mm -hmm. don't get us into debt. That's libertarian. Let people live their lives as they want. They're pro-choice. Mm -hmm. That's up to the woman to just make that decision. Mm -hmm. Gay marriage, go have a pride, a pride parade. God bless. Capital punishment, mistakes are made. We are human. 
Mm -hmm. Libertarian Party don't want to be any part of murdering an innocent person. Let's let's talk about then Thirty Eight Studios. Um, you know, you and, and as we love to refer to him on the show, Captain Carl, and a handful of hardy citizen dissidents were the only folks, literally willing to take on the mob because it was a mob. It was a mob. It, 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 describe if you if you could what it felt like to oppose that and and what was some of the. I mean, people were literally just throwing stuff up against the wall. What, what was the atmosphere at that point? Well, the amazing thing was that Governor Kachiri had put together the uh, uh, economic board that consisted of all the bigwigs in Rhode Island. Paul Choquette and Al Varecki and Donna Capello from Verizon and uh -huh. on and on. Tim Babineau from Rhode Island Hospital. All the luminaries of Rhode Island business. Uh -huh. And except for Captain Carl, they all voted for it. Right. And I was at a breakfast, where I, and I was running for governor, right. being opposed to it. And at the breakfast, I, I said, you know, if this fails, and it very possibly and probably will, mm -hmm. this is the potential and the precedent to have a lawsuit to get against those that voted for it. Mm -hmm. Wall Street was starting to have with the backlash against boards that have made poor decisions. Mm -hmm. board, the, uh, the stockholders were mm -hmm. suing the board of directors of their company, saying uh, malfeasance. And what a roar went up from that breakfast. <laughs> ah, someone started swearing at me. From, it was a Chamber of Commerce breakfast. So all the business people were there. And you know something? They never apologized, these people, for their bad decision. They started to point fingers. Chafee mismanaged it and, and, well, and, and, and try and blame somebody else. And they never, none of them ever so-called manned up and said, that was, that was one of the dumbest things I've ever done in my life. Right. Give Kurt Schilling $75 million. It's it beyond, beyond belief that well, that could happen. And all the big business people, Governor Kachiri, God bless him, he can propose whatever he wants. But to have that board uh, well, to the vote notion, for it of all those people, except so, for Carl. Someone like Governor Kachiri, Don Kachiri, who is a, a sophisticated businessman who had worked in the 14th Actually, he wasn't that good a businessman. Well, Old I, Stone I'm, went kaput. I, I'm, I'm just throwing you out there. I'm kind of keeping it at a high level okay. for a second. He came the, from the facts a, do not support that he was a good business person. Well, certainly after this. What was the other company he worked for? Ameri uh, um, Cookson? Cookson, yeah, Cookson Ameri Ameri That yeah. one? Belly up. Well, he came from an environment. Okay, so I'll stipulate you. I, I hated 38 Studios. And, you know, I've, to your point about not apologizing, there are people now who claim, if I mention, for example, that a former, a recent Joe, Joe Trillo, former gubernatorial candidate, who I like Joe on a personal level, but when I mentioned that he voted for it, he claims he was lied to, he claims that this, that, and I just pointed out to him that there were citizen activists, and you and Carl, who had pointed out... The right from day one. From as soon one. as I saw it in the paper. Before they even cut the check. And then I even brought up the bloody sock. <laughs> yeah. and that just I said, how do we trust someone that uh, his own teammate accused of faking the bloody sock? Uh, and that turned into a national story. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. This, this is what is such an enigma to me. In so many cases, decisions you made on seemingly workaday governmental issues that were worthy of debate, in many cases highly questionable, somehow became the focus of literally a national media story. What, what, what do you attribute to that? Is it, is it just the fact that, that you were sort of iconoclastic stand against these when it was considered standard operating procedure so outraged people? Uh, I've given a lot of thought to that. Why has this been this tidal wave, the tsunami of criticism on so many of my sound proposals? Mm -hmm. And I think the national media, the mainstream media, are mad at me for uh, being right on Iraq. I, that, I, I do believe that. And they were all wrong. They all got it wrong. The Times, the Post, and mm -hmm. NBC, ABC, CBS, they all had it wrong. Mm -hmm. and, no. they, and they don't like that I was right. To, to this day. The only Republican to vote against it. And I had no hesitation mm -hmm. about voting against that right. Iraq war. Right. It was absolutely ludicrous that Saddam Hussein was a threat to the United States of America. He right. didn't even, in the end, he didn't even have a helicopter or a tank or World War I guns fighting an American military. It was, it's a tragedy. With 38 studios... They're mad at me because I was right. I, and we're going we're gonna to explore that because in, in the run up to the publicity for your appearance this week. I, I Christmas say, tree, they jump on people it's a stupid thing. All I said is don't spend any more mm -hmm. than what we spent last year. Do what you right. did last year when they came and said, what are you going to do for the State House celebration? Do what you did last year, just don't spend any more and don't spend any less. I don't right. want to be criticized for being a Scrooge. 
That was my only instructions. And the invitation gone out for the last eight years, calling it a holiday tree. It wasn't my decision. I don't care what they call it. So they did what they did last year, and in came the tsunami. Well, Nash Bill O'Reilly came to the state house. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> folks need to understand yeah, that when, when it comes to the talking heads, particularly on the three major cable networks, that there's a distinct similarity between them and worldwide wrestling. People adopt a role, and then they use whatever host organism they can to leech off of that for their own clicks, their own personal publicity. And if they can find a story that they can generate a significant amount of outrage for on, they're going to. But, but a last thought on 38. It's Killer Kowalski and Haystack Calhoun and... <laughs> the Iron Sheik. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, Kurt Schilling, a, a few years ago, in, in, in his first real public comment, was interviewed by John DePietro on WPRL. And I had the opportunity to question him. And, and um, this, is, this is what, to me, was the most illuminating point. I asked him, how does he... And I want your reaction to this. I asked him, how does he reconcile the notion that he considers himself a small business, cap, free market business person, when he took such an overwhelming amount of money without personal guarantee, and my big fault with Karcheria is without a board seat, a guy who's a, allegedly a veteran of, of corporate you know, boardrooms, how does he reconcile those two notions? And he said, and he explained that, first of all, he wasn't, you know, he didn't think he was going to lose. He didn't think he was going to uh, fail. He didn't think... But the you know, question like, is, how do you reconcile your hatred of public subsidies, and then you go and you get one. Well, well, the, biggest one the biggest one in Rhode Island history. Right, and they, so he explained... Call yourself a conservative and then go grab $75 million of Rhode Islanders' money. Right. Yeah, it's but, complete but, but, hypocrisy. But what he said was fascinating. At the very end, and we have it on tape because uh, we saved it, uh, what was fascinating, he actually just as an afterthought, because it's always the afterthoughts that get you, right? As an afterthought, he said, by the way, he said, if I was the governor, I never would have taken that deal. <laughs> <laughs> All right? And, and, and I almost, I was on the air yeah, So he jobbed us, and he, 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 at least he was honest. The, does the, there are still apologists for 38 Studios and Kurt Schilling, who, and I just, I, I want you to really shred this, who somehow have the balls to blame your public denunciation of it, and for the record, for the people of Rhode Island, cite its deathbed status as the reason why they weren't able to get additional funding. They, are, they, they hang their entire hat on that thin premise. Could you please, for once and all, just kind of just put that to bed? Well, we had Kurt Schilling come in to the EDC as the company was collapsing mm -hmm. and give a presentation for that continued funding. He right. wanted $15 million. We get it through film credits or something. I was opposed to it, but there was a f board. Would we have 12, 15 people on that board? Right. And he could not convince them that it was worth it. He didn't have the votes. It wasn't Link Chafee right. that was opposed to it. It was the board. Right. And uh, he just couldn't make a convincing case to take more of our taxpayer money that it was going to lead a bridge to some kind of successful uh, video game. He, he couldn't convince them. I, w I was never going to be convinced. I, I just, it's such a tough business uh, you know, from the experts that are in it. They said it's no place for an amateur, which he was. And, and, and yet, a few years later, we talked a little bit about this while we were this, before the show started. If you remember back then, the conservative mantra was you don't support small business, you don't support business if you're not willing to give these subsidies. Flash forward, a, a political generation, if you will, and a group of folks buy a local baseball team, and they want again, taxpayer money, ironically the same amount, to subsidize a private baseball stadium. What, we, what would you, as Lincoln Chafee, as governor at that point in time, what would you have said to that? I'm very conservative. And uh, on the baseball in particular, I'm alarmed at the declining attendance numbers mm -hmm. at AAA baseball in Pawtucket. Mm -hmm. They're just cratering from a high in 2003 or so, 2004 and there, uh, just down every year. And the young people, they're not interested in baseball is the, the answer. Mm -hmm. They're playing lacrosse and soccer and other sports. It's, it's too boring. Uh, but, on a, but on a philosophical level, should government be subsidizing or investing in private properties owned by fabulously wealthy people? Again, I'm very conservative on any time we're spending the taxpayer's money. If someone can convince me that in the long run it's going to be beneficial mm -hmm. for the taxpayer, I'd be willing to look at it. But I'm going to be very, have a very, very sharp pencil mm -hmm. and, and be demanding on questions and the, getting the answers that this is going to be beneficial for the fact, taxpayer with zero risk. Mm -hmm. This is a slam dunk. I don't know if the, the Civic Center uh, had some 
taxpayer money, what an asset that has been mm -hmm. to Providence, to having a, a, a hockey team here, a top minor league hockey team, hosting circuses and figure skating and mm -hmm. uh, tractor pulls and Providence College basketball filling it with 12,000 people. You, you can make the argument that that was a good investment but for the, the taxpayer. But, and, and this is, it goes along the fit libertarian lines, it's a free market project that's, it, that we would maintain that's best run by people in the free market. And if you interfere, if you prop up, and, and let's look at the convention center, which has been an absolute disaster financially. It continues to be a, a subsidy. And let's look at the shopping mall, which while has generated a lot of business, some would argue it's merely taken business from other parts of the state, it's about to face, amazingly enough, it's yours and mine almost a lifetime, a generation, if you will, it's, it's about to face the end of its tax, tax agreement, if you will. And now all of a sudden, as Senator Sam Bell points out, there's an opportunity for the city of Providence to, rec to realize those property taxes. If, if, if we continue to subsidize private entries into the free market with government money, they, they are not subject to the same competitive pressures as those who do it the right way. Shouldn't we just... And we are back. If you're just joining us for the first time, it is my profound honor to be sharing the stage, if you will, with Senator Lincoln Chafee, mayor, governor, senator, environmentalist. We haven't touched on that yet. Before we had a little bit of a, a, a glitch, a hiccup, if you will, I had posed the question, you know, is it ever appropriate for government to use its economic clout, its power, its money, its ability to, quite frankly, on a federal level, to print money, to subsidize private businesses in what is allegedly a free market. And it's a question that really goes to the root, of, one of the roots, if you will, of the libertarian movement. And what, what are your thoughts about that? I'm opposed to public subsidies for companies because you're picking winners and losers. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes there's a company that's been there, right. loyally paying their taxes, for 40, 50, 60, 80 years, whatever it might be, you're bringing in a competitor with public subsidy right? and, and not paying the same property taxes, sales tax, whatever it might be, these different incentives. So I've been opposed to it. And as mayor of Warren, a company came into the mayor's office and sat down and said, we want to move uh, out of Providence to Warwick. What mm -hmm. can you do for us on tax breaks? And I said, what are you looking for? And they laid out a menu of what they're looking for. And I just, just said, frankly, we don't do that. We treat all businesses the same. We're going to keep your taxes down. We're going to have a good sewer system. We're going to have a good water system. We're going to have good public safety. We're going to have good schools. That's what I can offer. Right. But I cannot offer a tax break when just across the street somebody is <laughs> loyally paying their, their taxes. Snap went the briefcases. Click, click, click. Up they went and left. And we were you know, 200 people they were going to bring into the city. And that's always a big for politicians, a great announcement to have. Right. All of a sudden, I'm a hero. I brought in the company with 200 people. Never mind the details of what we had to pay to get them. So we all kind of looked at each other and said, gee, uh, did we make a mistake? <laughs> and I just something didn't. we said? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I said, no, I just don't want to go down that road. It's a bad road to go down. Is this a true story? Six months later, they came back in the mayor's office and said, we like your city. We're moving in anyway, and they're still there. They're called Beacon Mutual Insurance Company, and they're right off 95, and they've got their 200, 250 people, good jobs, and not a penny of subsidies. So sometimes you have to call their bluff. That's exactly what happened there. Well, they wanted to come anyway. Well, well, they wait, were going to come wait, anyway. You actually negotiated with them from a position of strength? That's right. <laughs> good, good fire, good police. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, Decent really? schools. <laughs> you know, I, system that's... Not corrupt and 
a good, honest government. Yeah. And they said that's where we want to be. And and they were looking for a, they were looking for a handout. Right. And when I told them no, they came anyway. I, you know, I look at the current administration. I'm not here tonight to to demonize anyone. Well, I. I Kind of am, but I'm, I'm not going to go down that road. When you know, we had a situation here with Vistaprint, where again, big dollar subsidies. There is no shortage of high quality printing companies here in the state of Rhode Island who are going through their own consolidation, upheaval, challenges. It's 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 an industry wrought with 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 challenges right now. There's lots of consolidation going on. They're paying high energy prices here in Rhode Island. They're active in the community, we've heard this story before, and you're going to subsidize competition, and, and it's not right. What there, what there seems to be, and, and, and another show, I hope to have you on a couple of times, whatever you want to, but you know, part of a classical liberal arts education, there I said it, is, is, is critical thinking skills and analysis. And when you analyze this, the basic economics of a situation where one company, through subsidies, is able to operate at an advantage and could have a higher, a higher seat in the food chain and competing for limited consumer dollars in a, in, a, in a challenging economy like Rhode Island's, what do we think is going to happen? Well, the temptation is for the politicians to have that big hit, to have mm -hmm. that announcement, and who cares who has to pay for it down the road or mm -hmm. whether the competitor goes out of business because you just brought in a subsidized company as a competitor. You mentioned the, uh, the printing company business. Right. And the politicians, too many of them, they're shallow. They don't care about tomorrow. I just want this good announcement for today. And that, that, that's the unfortunate temptation. And that's why we get these subsidies. Sure, I'll pay. I'll, I'll shovel up with taxpayer money mm -hmm. and have a nice big announcement. Cranes in the air and all right. that supposedly good stuff. And then 10 years down the road, uh, the economy is starting to go bad because uh, it's, it's not an equal footing, not a right. level playing field for companies. Right. And we continue. If you have good schools, good roads, good water, take care of government, the minimum that we're supposed to do as a government. That's how you do economic development in my view. Right. Now I, I, I'm with you on that. Now, of, of course, the elephant in the room, Iraq. Um, talk about an issue that has come full circle. In the libertarian movement, a significant portion of so what some would argue the lion's share of the growth of the libertarian market a movement has been, interestingly enough, through American veterans, many of whom are veterans of a variety of adventures that we've had in the Gulf states, uh, whether it be the generational war in Afghanistan. I guess we, we retreated to the notion last week that there are now young men and women fighting in Afghanistan who were not born when the attack on the World Trade Center took place. Um, Iraq, you know, Afghanistan was supposed to be the good war, if you will, and I'll use that term very carefully, but it was the good war because in its initial stage it was a reaction against an American attack on American soil. Iraq, however, was of course at the time the center controversy. Now, a, a, President Bush at the time had unparalleled support, if you will, amongst people. Um, People were literally naming their children and their pets after Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, you know, it is the, the notion, rather than coalesce Americans around the sacrifice of war and its legitimacy of it, instead Americans were somehow educated in the notion that as a consumer, that if we spent money, that was our patriotic duty. So we lost a real connection with what it meant to go to war. Talk about, if you will, the, your, your thought process at the time, what your conscience said to you, and then, as I mentioned, in the run-up to your appearance on the show, we talked about uh, some legislation that was advanced by Carl Levin um, that you supported as opposed to this rush to war. Give us, a, give us a real background on that. Well, the real background is that I grew up in the Vietnam era, mm -hmm. and uh, that tragic fiasco sears into my conscience and I was just young enough not to be drafted, mm -hmm. but certainly lived through uh, everything that occurred in Vietnam. So when Iraq came up, I'm thinking, not again, not again. We're not going to do another Vietnam. And I want to see the proof 
that there's weapons of mass destruction, whatever the allegations were going to be. And there was never any proof. There was never any proof about that. I walked into the Senate chambers as confident as ever to vote no. There's no way I was going to put my name on that vote to go into Iraq. And you said that the, President Bush had so much public support. Yes, after September 11th, people were angry and they were fearful. When people are scared and they're angry, it's easy to mislead them. And that's exactly what Rumsfeld and Cheney and they, and they all did, Condoleezza Rice and uh, the whole gang, the whole neocon gang. And now that they're wrong, you've never heard them admit it, we were wrong. Right. And then they're still going on talk shows, Condoleezza Rice, and never admitting it. They said, oh, it was flawed intelligence. Baloney wasn't flawed intelligence. I knew there was no weapons of mass destruction because there was never any proof that there was. And uh, I'd like to have any one of the neocons, any one of those people I mentioned, come forward and say, American people, here's the real reason we went to Iraq. Because it certainly wasn't about weapons of mass destruction. That's a joke. And it certainly wasn't, is it about oil? Come and tell us about it. Is it because of oil? Well, do we want to scramble the Middle East and get the Shia and the Sunni fighting each other? And, and that's beneficial to our long-term interests? I'd like to have one of them, any one of them, right. come forward, <laughs> look the American people in the eye, and say, this is why we went into Iraq. Yeah, but the lies continue. The lies continue that flawed intelligence, and uh, I, I, it makes me angry. As, a, as someone that came up through Vietnam. At that time... And, and you mentioned vets coming to the libertarian movements. That, that tragedy of 4,000 Americans losing their lives, spending $6 trillion, all the vets that lost their legs and arms over there, mm -hmm. they have a right to be angry. We like to say that very, very often. We like to say that the... And welcome the, to the Libertarian Party. Because right. the, the status quo is why we got into Iraq. The very Democrats, best. the majority of them voted mm -hmm. for it, and the majority of the Democrats in the Senate voted for the war. Right. The very best way to respect our, the, the men and women serving in our nation's military is not to engage them in useless foreign adventures that are driven by whatever personal means that the current commander-in-chief... Yes, it, um, especially um, lies, right. when they're lies, bald-faced right. lies. Right. Talk about it, because you, you bring up an important point. Like I said, I did in my research running up to the show, because, you know, I've lived through so much of this. But at the time, I'll be honest with you, I was a neocon. I, I spent a good part of my life working in the neighborhood and working on and in the World Trade Center. Um, and so, and the company that I was kind enough to have me as a contractor for a number of years uh, lost 300 people that day. Yeah, wow. Uh, so, I, I've got, you know, I, I friends of mine who I'd known for 10 or 15 years. We never really had a good investigation of to what exactly went wrong and why we didn't pursue the Phoenix memo that, that the FBI right. had the, the, in, in July before September. Mm -hmm. There was a memo from the agents in Phoenix saying these people are taking uh, pilot lessons and they don't want to learn how to land. And, and there, there was a, the, the system was blinking, blinking red and, uh, and, uh, and we just didn't respond. We captured one of the Masawi was captured in Minneapolis, one of the hi hijackers. Mm -hmm. He's still in jail. Well, how come we couldn't uncover this plot? Well, and, and very t at that time, too, when you looked across the country, there was a heritage of, of political operatives running some of our institutions who had no business being there. And, and, and Logan Airport and Massport was certainly one of them. But there existed at the time, and, and this happens so many times in, in American culture, where there's a binary option. You, in this case, you were either for the war and you were an American patriot, or you were weak and you were against the war. And, and you suffered politically because of that, because there were those who were in favor of the war who tried to use that, conflate that, with your patriotism and, and, and what your attitudes were to, you know, American interventionism. Yeah, the same thing happened in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Patriotism was questioned for those who were, were opposed to our policy in Vietnam. But, but I want to focus, there was, at the time of the of the legislation, that there was a third, It wasn't binary. Right. There was a third choice. Yes. And tell us about that, because it's, it's a compelling story about what could have been. Uh, Senator Levin, Carl Levin from Michigan, proposed mm -hmm. just to slow this down. It was called the Levin Amendment, mm -hmm. to the war authorization. Right. And it was saying, we're going to let the UN inspectors, Hans Blix, if you remember your history, going in, and uh, there was a whole team of UN inspectors go in and see if there are weapons of mass destruction. Right. That was the point of the Levin Amendment. Slow down the rush to war. We're going to take our time and be methodical and see if it's worth mm -hmm. 4,000 American lives and $6 trillion is what it ended up 
costing us and all those injuries. And the 11th Amendment lost. There were two votes, bang, bang. First 11th Amendment, and it was defeated 76 to 24. And then 10 minutes later, we go on to the war resolution, and that's approved by almost the same vote, one vote difference, 77-23. Only 23 of us voting against this absurd premise that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction that threaten the United States against our powerful military that we have. It was just absurd. Right. And, and, and the 11th Amendment failed. The, 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 the senators, the so-called most deliberate body in the world, didn't even consider, slow it down. That's what the 11th Amendment was proposing. 76-24, and then 77-23 to go to war. And you mentioned that before the show was uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein. She was, was the only one that voted for 11 and then for the war. Right. The 20 other 23 of us voted for 11 and then against the war. If the Lebanon Amendment had passed, and this is, a, this is a pretty broad question, so it's unfair like most questions in this situation are, what impact do you think that would have had on American history? Oh, my gosh, my gosh. Uh, the, the Middle East is a mess. The refugee crisis that's flooding Europe. Europe is being destabilized by the flood of refugees that are leading to nationalist, ultra-nationalist governments being elected in Austria and some of these places, Hungary, because they're mad. Everywhere, it's a flood of people coming from northern Africa and Syria. It's all because of the, what we did in Iraq. In my view, we mm -hmm. broke the, we broke the we broke paradigm, yep. and, and now these poor people are fleeing the violence and mm -hmm. coming to uh, Europe, and that's destabilizing Europe. So it would be a completely different history. I'm very, very scared about the rise of ultranationalism in Europe. And, and, and and expand on that. I have a friend in, in Germany that says it's unbelievable how it's changed how many people are coming in and they're on the social services and, and frankly they look different, they speak different. It's all that type of thing that leads to uh, the unfortunate rise of what they call ultranationalism, fascism, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. it it's scary. Right. And, and all because of what we did in my view right. uh, and the 11th Amendment <laughs> would have prevented that. Right. There, there are times in history... Make that argument. Right, in the Middle East, you know, I point out that in 2016, um, it was the 100th anniversary, if you will, of the, the movement by Western Europe to divvy up, uh, divvy up what we now refer to as the Middle East. And that started a dangerous track of interventionism, which then was compounded by our strategical and our philosophical errors in the Middle East. And, and, and listen, I was, I was part of that nattering mob. I was, uh, yeah, let's, we'll show them, we'll, you know, the, what, what were the cliches? We'll turn Baghdad into glass and you know, bomb them into the into the, the Middle Ages. Don't forget the Tigris and Euphrates. This is the cradle of civilization when we were growing up. That's that, right there. That's where Tigris and Euphrates are. That's where civilization first took root. Right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's so ironic uh, that we uh, are going back to our Cro-Magnon tendencies. Right. And, uh, and in the in the Tigris and Euphrates. Which is right. And 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 it's unfortunate because at that same time, that 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 sort of that, 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 that wrestling match that occurs between media outlets now really seem to take hold, and which has led to the lack of ability. I, I call it the end of knowledge because it's no longer important. Facts are no longer important. History is no longer important. Underlying knowledge of cultures and, and what's actually at stake here, it's all about talking points, and, and we continue to suffer from that from that today. Yeah, you called it um, pro wrestling. Right. Yeah. Is, is it possible? Yeah, there's no Walter Cronkite. No, is it, is it, there are no profiles and coverage out there, believe me. Is it possible? Making for, money. Everyone's just trying to make money, make a dollar. If, if, you, if you're a politician now, now let, let's take AOC. Now, as a, as a libertarian, as you can imagine, there's significant parts of her platform with which make me insane. But let's remember just, it was just a few, uh, a month or two ago where she led opposition to the um, to to that incredible incredible subsidy for Amazon in New York City it led to its led a popular revolt against it which led forced the mayor politically de Blasio to, and other people to back away from it yeah. and she imagine was, giving Amazon a subsidy <laughs> <laughs> Rhode Island tried. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we listen. We we were right there in the richest food chain. company and the fastest growing company in the world. But 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 she again, 
and, and again, I disagree with her on just about everything. But it's the Give same. Give her credit for that. But, but, but it would appear that we are incapable of listening. Is it possible to have informed political dissent in the current American political culture? Can that exist anymore? Can a younger Lincoln Chafee come up and just, as much as, uh, crap as you had to take from people, do, we, do pol young politicians even get that far anymore? It's different. It's definitely different than the 30 years that I've been in it. And mm -hmm. it, it, it has turned into pro wrestling and there is no more Walter Cronkite's mediating and saying, slow down, let's listen, let's hear what they have to say, AOC, mm -hmm. whoever, Link Chafee, whoever it might be, let's listen right. uh, for a change instead of just screaming and taking the sledgehammer and, uh, and distorting the facts, frankly, also. There are a lot of fake news. I, it, I've lived it. I've lived it. Yeah. There's a lot of fake news out there. Uh, and so I, hope springs eternal. That's, that's all, the best answer I can give. And you just have to fight through the Internet. And, and certainly President Trump's on Twitter uh, making his points, whether you like him or not. At least he's bypassing the mainstream media. Uh, so the, things are changing all the time. Let's talk now for a few minutes about your, your, the political transformations of Link Chafee. Um, you started out as from a background, as we spoke earlier in the show, as, as a Rockefeller or a Republican as you could ever be. You, 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 were, you were molded in that image. Now, there's a tendency under the current revisionist history that looks back on, on uh, Rockefeller Republicans as, as rhinos. And again, I, I don't always agree with Eisenhower, what Eisenhower, too. Eisenhower was socially liberal, fiscally conservative. I, I, I don't want to just pigeonhole people like that. What were some, you know, you talk about your father's accomplishments, Eisenhower's accomplishments. Um, there were, as a libertarian, I'm obviously extremely free market and ex want really to diminish the role of government. But at the same time, there was a nobility, if you will, in politics at that time that doesn't exist right now. How, talk about the change because you've gone through, you know, you, you've evolved, you've changed, you, you, you've moved along, you, you've, you, you've had an intellectual curiosity about these different movements that public life doesn't want to forgive. What, what have you learned or what have you seen along the lines of what, what's brought you to, you know, you know at least a, the beginning of an embrace of the libertarian movement? Well, first of all, I would challenge anybody, any cr my, of my many critics, to find anywhere where I've been inconsistent. Mm -hmm. I've always been fiscally conservative. I've always worried, concerned about the environment. I've always been averse to foreign entanglements. I've always been in favor, and this is where I differ a little bit with libertarians, with using the tools of government to build a middle class. Mm -hmm. and there's some ways, I'm very conservative about it, but there's some ways, the Pell Grants, so mm -hmm. uh, the, the disadvantaged people can get a college degree. The head start, so the, the wealthy are sending their kids to pre-K and nursery school. So head start programs. See, there are some ways where government can help build a middle class, and I've been completely consistent on that. But the pro-choice, pro-environment, the Republican Party started to be anti-choice, anti-environment, pro-war, everything I was against. Mm -hmm. So I haven't changed. Right. And then I ran for governor as independent. I was a solo practitioner as governor. I didn't have a political body having my back and right. believe me I was taking the arrows in the back and, and, and by the way I just want to put some put party chair that could right. defend me I was a, I was a solo th th those were challenge and I'm not I'm not here yeah, to, to was terrible it just 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 yeah. absolutely people were losing their homes foreclosure right people were out of work it was not easy and right. we just methodically went about getting the economy going again uh, and took some abuse along the way. And, and so I did want to join a party. I joined the Democrats. I was disappointed. I ran for president as a Democrat. Mm -hmm. I was very disappointed that, that how they treated the other candidates. It was Hillary Clinton's uh, right. God-given nomination to yeah. be yeah, the nominee for the party. And, uh, and the mainstream media was very part of it. They, they wouldn't report on anything the rest of us said. Finally, Bernie took, got a little bit of traction, but they pretty much ignored him, too. Jim Webb was in it, Martin O'Malley and myself. We'd get nothing, absolutely nothing. It was, this is Hillary's, just get out of the way. Right. So I didn't want to stay in that party. And uh, so that's how I ended up being a libertarian. And when I first looked at it, when I moved to Wyoming, so I got to register to vote out here. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be a Republican. I'm not going to be a Democrat. One of my choices. I was surprised how much I agreed with libertarians. I think on their statement of principles, mm -hmm. 
there are 30 principles that they have in writing. And I think I have to agree with 24 of them, uh -huh. and only two or three I'm very opposed to, so um, one on education, one on Social Security, uh -huh. and the others I'd be willing to uh, uh, study more. But most of them, a vast majority of the principles, I vigorously agree with. Anti-war, anti-deficit, pro-choice, pro-gay rights, anti-capital punishment, anti-tapping uh, uh, our phones, protect that, which we call the Fourth Amendment, protection of the Fourth Amendment. Uh -huh. You need a warrant to tap our phones. Uh -huh. That's not happening now. Right. That's all libertarian. And I'm proud to be a libertarian. We, in, in important, and in, in we do an hour every week on, on libertarians at, in the 8 o'clock hour, 8.30 hour, whatever. We, we talk often about the statement of principles. And, and it's critical to reinforce for someone for someone like yourself who's relatively new to the movement or, and, 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 and studying it. Uh, what's interesting is you have to have an overwhelming majority of the, of the votes at our annual, or our biannual yeah. national convention yeah. to even yeah. touch them. Yes. It, it's... They yeah. are so locked in. The non-aggression yeah. non principle is, is fundamental. But we will not use force or coercion Pro -choice. to our advantage. Pro-choice. So we, we look at these the issues. Bob they leave him alone. <laughs> leave the poor guy alone. Consenting well, adults. We're the only... Or actually make it legal so they're not sex slaves. Right. We're, 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 wow. You see, we're the only political party that has a pro-sex workers plank in their convention. Yeah, that's right. The convention, that's right. At our make convention. it legal. Get the Johns and all that illegal stuff out of there. It's, it's a free market transaction between consulting adults. If it's not, we have ample laws to take care of it. That's right. But until then... A little bit out there, but worth considering. We, we've got a little we'll bit of a... Look at Bobcraft. Got, we've got a little bit of a march coming down the street. Oh, uh, the, um, this is... Uh, is it Black Lives Matter or is it... This is interesting. Uh, that dog. This is Providence and it's Pride yeah, Weekend. Yeah. Everybody is out. Um, That's fabulous. The... Look what, at the diversity. Look at the diversity. <laughs> <laughs> we, should, we should invite him in. The, um, both political parties have done terrible jobs of, let's just say, giving opportunity for folks from the outer limits of their organization. The, the Republican Party was ghastly to the Ron Paul movement, much to their... I think ultimate demise because a significant part of the libertarian movement are folks also from the Rand Paul movement. And of course, the Democrats were just terrible, terrible to folks who supported Bernie and folks who made a support of yourself or Mr. O'Malley or Mr. Webb, who all had contributions to me. Now we took a beating. How dare you challenge Hillary? How and dare you? So, <laughs> so, so, what does that say when both of these organizations are willing to? twist and turn themselves to whatever degree necessary to become to become the power that seems it's, to be it's the time challenge. it's time for a change and mm -hmm. it, i think the libertarian party has the best chance to beat that change but it's it's way overdue we're polarized we're gridlocked we're in our trench warfare mm -hmm. nothing's getting done the supreme court has become a political body it, it, it's a republicans and democrats it's not justices of the supreme court uh, the courts Republicans and Democrats. It's time for a change. Now, and, and I didn't even get a chance to talk to you about uh, the Alito nomination, which was also another benchmark m moment in your career, political career, which, again... The main, vote, my main reason for voting against Sam Alito was because he would uh, overturn Sandra Day O'Connor's compromise. He was taking Sandra Day O'Connor's seat, mm -hmm. and it was a 5-4 vote on a woman's reproductive rights. And he, I just, he could not answer me satisfactorily that he was going to take out what Sandra Day O'Connor had uh, and the health and welfare of the mother in mm -hmm. any kind of state law that restricted abortion. Mm -hmm. Sandra Day O'Connor has to include con the health and welfare of the mother. The state law has to have that in there mm -hmm. before they can enact a restriction on Roe versus Wade. And, and Alito, and as soon as he got in, he did exactly what I thought he would do. Out went health and welfare of the mother. Right. States could pass any law they wanted. What, what in, in your exploration of the libertarian movement, what are you challenged by? What don't you agree with? Uh, the Social Security, some of the views on Social Security I don't understand, uh, mm -hmm. and on abolishing the IRS. 
they have that in the statement of principles? We, I mean, we, I don't like taxes any more than anybody else, but we do need them, and there has to be some entity that collects them. I, I don't like it, but you kind of have to have it. Well, and, uh, and, and that's probably the, the big Those thing. are the big ones. And then also school vouchers. Mm -hmm. I've always thought that a public school system made America great. And we just have to be careful about skimming cream off the top with all the different mm -hmm. voucher systems and different schools that the government pays for right. under the so-called libertarian voucher mm -hmm. of view. I, I, I believe in the American public education system. It's not perfect, right. but gosh darn, it made us the greatest country in the world. The, the challenge, and I'll address some of this for you briefly, without... Uh, Those are the big three. Second Amendment, I've... Uh, well, okay, I, now you see, now that, that's, you've got a... a I do, I've always you. thought that we need the NRA and the gun advocates to come to the table. Because mm -hmm. the Americans love their guns, that's just the way it is. And we need them to come and sit down and talk about do we need assault weapons and, mm -hmm. and have the NRA and the, sit down and say, look, we're going to make some common sense laws here. Well, and, and let me, let me explain. We're not coming to take away all the guns. Well, let, me, let me kind of explain it. You see, there's, there's two levels, if you will, to a libertarian's approach, and this is my personal opinion what they say on the web, IMA show, in my humble opinion. There's the philosophical and the practical. On a practical level, you know, when we talk about crony corporatism, crony capitalism, cronyism in general, um, there's a tendency for folks to obsess over the practical applications of it. Will the investment work or not? In the case of a stadium, for example, I spent probably too much time arguing the pros and cons of the, the underlying economics of the stadium, whereas in, later on, as I kind of got on my own libertarian journey, I came to understand that the, the primary argument was the appropriateness of government using the coercive force of taxation to redistribute money from people using force, because, you know, I don't get a, when they come for the bill, I don't get to say no, all right, and then using that to give to other folks. And I recognize now how important it is to focus on the immorality of that, and then as a secondary, let's talk about the investment. When it comes to guns, there's, there's a tendency for folks to, to, to focus on the, the sporting issue versus the assault weapon issue. And a libertarian like myself, so speaking for myself only, not the Rhode Island Party, not anyone else, but sees that the right to engage in self-defense is a, a, a birthright, a right given to me by the creator. And the method by which I do that um, is immaterial. Because ultimately, and my good friend John Fennessy is much more eloquent about this, if you're listening, John, because uh, you know, he'll know I'll mess this up. But ultimately, the challenges begin not at possession of weapons, but at aggression with weapons. And so ultimately, in their purest form, I should be able to own what I choose. It's the same way that we approach borders. Folks say, you're the, you know, free, free, you just say, you don't care about it. We, we, we honor a nation's right to engage in self-defense and to honor the, the sanctity of their borders. At the same time, though, we believe that property rights, my property rights, my ownership of land, and yes, I own it, is, allows me to dictate whom and when and where I can invite people to hunt. So a libertarian's response to the border crisis, if you will, much of it created by a hyperventilating president, um, is that I believe in the free exchange of people, ideas, and commerce. So, frankly, I don't, you know, and I'll, this is probably the only time I'll use the word fair in my favor, but I don't understand how one person born on one side of this floating rock we call Earth is allowed all the benefits of living in the United States with property rights and all that comes with it. And if you, um, by accident of birth, are born somewhere else, how is it that I maintain the right to exclude folks from my property if I want to have them on, and the right to exclude them from the opportunity to pursue life, liberty, and, and justice. And so these are, and, and equally important is that we don't endorse individual behaviors per se. For example, I support marriage You're equality. You're probably making the point we should be doing more to build the economy of Honduras. They don't come here than or building the, a wall. Or, or eliminate the war on drugs or engage in exactly, free capital exactly. with yes. everyone yes. so that yes. For, yes. We believe that the free markets will ra yeah. raise the tide for everybody. Yes. But just then they won't want to leave their homes. Across the most street. people don't. <laughs> most, you know, if you, I don't. I'm, I'm sure at one time or not, you, you met Omar Ba from the Refugee Dream Center, a noble individual who literally, a, a, a journalist back in, in, in Africa who literally escaped death to come to the United States, engages in, in free market activities, but at the same time gives an amazing 
contribution back to the community. But the, the, so why would I want to keep people like him who contribute and give so much and create so much opportunity for others in an economy? Why would I want, why would I want to prevent university professors from around the world from coming to Providence and creating wealth? And, and creating, lending their expertise. Why would I want to get in the way of that? Why the energy, the sophistication, yeah, I agree the labor force? We should be doing more. If they want to stay in their homes, and the drug war in South America is a big part of it. But but the drug. But the most important notion of libertarianism, per se, is Violence. that we don't we don't really support an individual behavior. We support your right to engage in behavior. So, for example, when it comes to marriage equality, we believe that everyone should be able to be in a monogamous relationship if they choose or not and to enjoy the property right protection that people who you know our our civilization has decided should enjoy when they're in a ordain or, or a recognized relationship yeah most so, of the libertarian statement of principles are very brave uh, and and quite frankly and there's an analogy here over time and this is kind of what I wanted to bring this all to Capital over punishment o over time torture both they're in there Right. On the print statement of principles, no but, torture. Right. But a lot of the things that you observed from the beginning have proven to be correct, and a lot of the things that we have fought for since 1972, since the early 70s, the party's formation, we were right. And that's why I'm hoping that to, you know, it, it's interesting because, because you were such an avowed, uh, you know, liberal Republican for so many years, there's, there's an initial hesitancy by people that, oh, Link Chafee's going to be, what will happen? Well, well, welcome to the movement. And, and I hope that, uh, you know, you can, to whatever degree, your position as a public policymaker and as someone who's got a bully pulpit can promote our positions and also grow to understand the ones that you don't, um, that you may not get along with or you may not at this point in time, because no one's born 100% libertarian. It's, it's a journey. Yeah. Well, and, don't forget, uh, we talked about Eisenhower Republicanism, don't forget his warning. And that's what we're up against. Mm -hmm. The military-industrial complex does not want an end to their profits, right. which they make out of making people angry and scared and getting mm -hmm. us to another war and another war and another war. They're making McDonnell Douglas and whoever they are gazillions of dollars. Of course they want their wars. Right. And, and part that's of, what we're up against. It's time for the libertarians to say, no, you're not running the country. We, the people, are. Right. And, and, and it's part of the political firmament of this state profits extensively, both in political campaign contributions, uh, from the very forces. Yeah, isn't there a similarity the between what's happening in the Gulf of Hormuz and Tonk Bay of Pig, I, uh, yeah. the Gulf of Tonkin? I, 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 I point <laughs> Some boats uh, get injured. Next thing you know, we get 60,000 dead Americans in Vietnam I, you in, know, in the Gulf of Tonkin. I, now we're in the Straits of Hormuz. Here we go again. I mentioned that on WPR. Oh, good. Afternoon. Jim Hummel was filling in on the Dan York show, and I, I used those words, and I could hear the strangled screams of Trumpetistas we go. everywhere around Rhode Island. Eisenhower was right. And, and the first thing that came to my mind was, you know, in three years are we going to have our Iranian Tet Offensive? Uh, can, we, can we try and prevent that? Yeah, right. Um, right. So what... Well, we're up against what Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex, and now it's almost a cliche, but... Uh, but it's man, not. Oh man, oh man, oh man. There's, 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 there's Here so... Here we go again. We, we've got... Kids are fighting Afghanistan who weren't even born right. when we first went in. That's, that's outrageous. The question that everyone's asking any time, and, 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 the, and the Libertarian Party has a long history of folks kind of sort of segueing in and out of the party. We mentioned earlier our mutual friend, uh, Mr. Weld. We'll leave him out of the conversation right now. Do you, uh, you know... I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. What, what are your plans in, in the libertarian movement? Are you, are you looking to join just philosophically and enjoy it? Are you looking to, to do anything publicly you know, uh, with the organization? Are you looking to run for office at any level? I mean, anything you want to tell us? Well, I had to register once I changed my residency to Wyoming. I had to list some affiliation, whether it was unaffiliated. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did my research, and I liked what the libertarians had to say, and we'll see where it goes. Okay. I like what they said on their statement of principles. It's there in writing. Yeah. It's good. The protection of the Fourth Amendment, no capital punishment, no debt, uh, foreign, avoid foreign entanglements. Mm -hmm. uh, on and on it goes. Pro-choice, pro-gay rights. But remember, the ba and this is the important message that I want to give to you. Uh, the important part of that 
is a respect for individual self-determination. And I know that's almost cliche at this point, but we talk for ourselves as the, the party, the ultimate party of minority rights and the ultimate minority being the individual. So the message that Libertarian Nation, and I'm, and I'm not the person to deliver it, but that I sense is that I deliver to people, it's not just a party of issues, it's, it's, a, it's a deep, deep philosophy that a, a, a few brave souls, much, you know, who suffered politically and, and as you can imagine at levels perhaps not as nationally or as well known as you, you've taken some shots, but you know, they were, you know, you came along 30 or 40 years ago and you talked about rolling back the state and, you know, we became in many ideas the party of pot and the party of free highways as opposed to a really mature exposition of what our underlying philosophy is. And, and that's, that's the thing that we're hoping that folks who are established political leaders, if they embrace, that they give voice to, you know, when we run for office so that you don't have a Slate.com slate focusing on, you know, the appearance or a select set of word tracks from a guy like Gary Johnson. I, 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 Gary Johnson was perhaps one of the most accomplished individuals ever to involve himself in the political world in the last 20 or 30 years. Yeah, and I, then he got, uh, they just destroyed him on Aleppo. Yeah, right. that's what they were waiting for. Now came the clubs. They right. ran it and ran it and ran it. And, 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 and here, the, you had two governors, and again, I he thought it was an acronym. He, he said, I, I, it was five o'clock in the morning or yeah, something yeah. after an all-night flight. That see, when you're when you're at a third party, you don't get the you're not put up at the the Carlton. You're not the makeup artists don't show up at eight o'clock with nice. with fresh squeezed orange juice. Um, I, but that's the message I want to I want to deliver. And and I well, what uh, I hear you, what you're saying about the core of who libertarians believe who they are, but they also have their statement of principles in writing. And mm -hmm. you yourself said you can't believe how hard it is to change those. It, it can't it ever can't happen. happen because. Get everybody at the convention. They start arguing. How are we going to change the platform committee or whatever it might be? Right. And uh, there they are in writing, thirty of them, and uh, they're pretty bold. And uh, they, they chart a course for America that's worth debating, in my view. Are, are you going to join us in Austin? Yeah, I plan to. I'd Excellent. like to be there. Excellent. Hey, it's you. I'm on the website. You will see an exercise in the body politic that I don't think exists. You, you, we're, we're both old enough to remember a time when the media would cover breath, breathlessly the platform hearings that took place at the Republican National and Democratic National Conventions. And I don't know if you'll even see them covered on ESPN 8 at this point. You know? <laughs> because no, because no. They, don't want, no, no. they don't want to commit no. to anything. They, they, they just simply don't. No, so it's the short attention span. I, I call American media short attention span theater. Yeah. And, yeah. and and again, I, I want to thank you for coming in tonight because Thanks, you've been here for an hour and a half, and it's not a tension short, short attention span theater on this show. <laughs> um, I, you, you're welcome here anytime if issues move you. I know some other time I'd like to talk to you about Invenergy because I know that's starting to rear its ugly head again, um, the issue that won't die. Uh, we have a, a lot of common friends. In well, the, my niece is getting married next week, so that's why I'm back in Rhode Island. And um, next time I'm around, let's get together. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pat. Senator Good rest of the show. Senator Lincoln Chafee. That's the difference between this show and... Uh...